Uh, it's my pleasure to get started. I'm going to introduce uh, the first two speakers. Uh, you can see their bi biographies. So the, the, the introductions are going to be brief. Um, first, um, Mrs. Ve Ms. Veasley, who's a co-founder and director of the Chronic Pain Research Alliance, and she'll be followed by Dr. Ryan, who's a family physician at Virginia Commonwealth University and practices at the Hayes E. Willis Health Center in South Richmond, where he's also the medical director. And they're going to start us off with uh, why this workshop matters, uh, lived experiences, uh, and, and provider perspectives. Thanks. Christine? Thank you, Dr. Delito, Dr. Cherkin, for your leadership on the planning committee. It's been a pleasure to work work with the rest of the uh, members of the committee in planning this workshop, and also thank you to the National Academies for inviting me to speak and for their organization of the meeting. I've been asked to talk about uh, what's going on on the ground level with patients, and as Dr. Cherkin mentioned, there's a huge gap between what's happening at the highest levels of science and medicine related to the management of pain, whether it's drug or non-drug treatments, and what's happening with the average everyday person who are trying to make point, um, point of decision uh, uh, decisions on how, how to manage their pain in non-pharmacologic treatment. I thought you needed me. I was walking towards me. So we're in a crisis right now. You know, we're in a, an unstable or crucial time where decisive change is impending. We have 100 million Americans who are suffering from chronic pain. Half a trillion dollars per year is being spent. It's the number one cause of disability. And according to new CDC analysis, we know that a lot of people are committing suicide because of, of their chronic pain. Um, and, it's, and, and we're in a state of chaos in our medical system. We have an insufficient workforce to address chronic pain. We have no team-based medical homes, with the exception of very few places. We have a number of pain disorders and subtypes that we don't understand very well. We have a symptom-based rather than a mechanism-based classification. We lack scientific understanding, as well as objective measures, diagnostics, and outcome measures. And we have you know, just a variety of therapies with unknown efficacy and risk. And it's creating personal crisis for millions of people in the United States, like Susan, who say to live in pain is to live in isolation. And what we've really seen over the last decade or so is an explosion of therapies, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, but we really don't have a lot of high-level evidence to say what works for whom, at what risk, and at what cause. The former um, FDA Commissioner Rob Califf said the field of chronic pain treatment is strikingly deficient in high quality scientific evidence. And this leaves patients on the ground level with very little uh, information to make decisions as well as their clinicians. So a lot of people have talked about the fact that we don't have this really good data on risk benefit cost analysis, which has left the smorgasbord of treatments for chronic pain. And a lot of physicians and other clinicians have mentioned that it feels almost like throwing uh, blindfolded darts to try to identify what treatments may work for one of their, some of their patients. And a colleague and friend of mine says, without data, we're just docs with opinions. And a lot of times when we talk about benefit and risk, we think about the risks of things like pharmacologic intervention or um, procedures, but there actually is risk associated with non-pharmacologic uh, treatments as well. I think we probably all agree that a Warrior three pose is probably not the greatest thing for an elderly person with NEOA, right? Um, and one way forward to think about this is to identify decisional dilemmas and then to develop research questions from there, which would allow us to generate an evidence base, improve reimbursement, and improve outcomes and reduce uncertainty. So I'm just, again, there's this gap. I'm not, when I'm talking today, I'm talking about what the average everyday person is experiencing when they're trying to make decisions about undergoing different treatments for chronic pain, not what's going on at the highest level of science and what we're starting to understand about efficacy and risk. So the first one is, how do I evaluate which non-pharmacologic options may work for me when there's little evidence to inform this decision? And we typically think about balancing benefit and risk but it's actually a little bit more complicated because it also involves cost and time. At the height of my, um, the worst part of my uh, pain experience, I was spending upwards of 20 hours a week managing chronic pain. That's equivalent to a part-time job. And I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on therapies that haven't been covered. Um, some of them have worked, some of them haven't. It's not to say that we don't have treatments that are good, that we don't have treatments that work. We just don't know how to identify which patients are going to improve with which therapies. 
So secondly, we know that you know polytherapy is 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 usually not what's done. We use multiple therapies, both drug and non-drug, to manage chronic pain. And so, how do you determine that combination of safe and effective treatments that's going to be best for each person? It's not just as simple as doing one treatment by one treatment by one treatment. It's usually a combination of treatments. And then within each non-pharmacologic treatment, there's been many different modalities, types, and techniques. So how do you determine which one is effective? You can't necessarily say that massage one is the same as massage two is the same as massage three, or can you? We really don't know. There's many different types of massage, and this applies for almost all other non-pharmacologic therapies. There's so many different types and modalities when you're on the ground level trying to figure out who do you go to and what type of this do they do. And really, the devil is in the details. We oftentimes talk about non-pharmacologics from this 30,000-foot view, but very rarely do we give patients very specific information about what we're recommending for them. And this is a typical kind of conversation between a clinician and a patient. Well, maybe you should try yoga. And the patient says, OK, but she's thinking, what kind, where, with whom? Because there's a very big difference between yoga that's fit for public consumption versus yoga for a patient population with a knowledgeable health care provider. And this is very rarely discussed. This is a um, recent systematic review of physical activity and exercise programs for chronic pain. And they looked at um, a, a multitude of chronic pain conditions. And really what they found is that the evidence level was very low. And one of the reasons they cited for this is that among all of these studies, there was a lot of difference between the frequency, the intensity, the duration, and the combination of different types of exercise and activity modalities. Um, and so the, that leads you to the question, what exactly is exercise therapy? You know, if my physician says to me, I think you should try an exercise program, what exactly are you recommending? Are you recommending all of these things on the list, some of them? What type, how frequent, how often? Are there identified standard components and a standard definition? You know, what exactly are we studying and what are we recommending? And then the question becomes, well, how long do I do this for and how often until I figure out does this work for me or not? Because as we know, chronic pain is so highly variable from day to day, week to week. It's very hard to know exactly what is or isn't working because it's so variable. It's not often times that you have a person who has a you know, seven point VAS scale and they go down to a two with a particular therapy or combination of therapies. And then, as we know, most pain patients don't just have pain. They have other comorbidities. And so then it becomes a little bit more complicated because we're not just talking about different therapies for pain, but now we're talking about combining therapies for pain plus non-pain comorbidities. So I think we'd all agree that the management or of a multidisciplinary approach for somebody with new onset OA is not going to be the same as someone with diabetic neuropathy who also has obesity and a sleep disorder, which is also not going to be the same for someone with fibro, IC, migraine, with cognitive impairments, sleep disorders, fatigue, mood disorders, and sexual dysfunction. So we have a lot of questions that remain. What are the optimal models? Do we need to do a stepped adaptive approach to understand the efficacy of combined therapies? How do I identify and standardize definition and components for research? Are there core components across non-pharmacologic interventions that account for efficacy? Which research models and designs are rigorous that we can utilize to generate evidence in a timely manner? And how do we address studying the many dozens of conditions, pain conditions, times the number of interventions? It's really not realistic to think that we're going to be able to study every intervention for every pain condition that exists. And that's obviously an important um, issue when it comes to making payment decisions. And I also wouldn't be doing my job if we didn't talk about knowledge translation, because it's not just about doing the research, as Dr. Cherkin mentioned. We have this huge gap. I'm sure most of us are familiar with this study that shows it takes 17 years to turn 14 percent of research to benefit patient care. I don't know about you, but when I go to the doctor, I don't want to have data that's 17 years old informing my care. And we've long been talking about one of the reasons for this is bridging this translational divide between basic science all the way up to patient care. And I think we all understand that this model is not working. It's broken. And that we really need to change the paradigm by including all necessary stakeholders from the start in these models and research collaboratives as we move forward so we can start thinking about implementation science early. We can start getting feedback from stakeholders like payers um, right from the get-go. 
But doing so requires mutual respect. I think many of us have seen this mug that says, please don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree. <laughs> and the patient's response that says, don't confuse the one hour lecture you had on my condition with my 20 years of living with it. Right? So we all have, a, 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 we all have a, an important perspective in this, but we have to respect each other's value and um, and contribution to the process. We speak different languages, but communication is possible. So in order to bridge the translational divide to ensure successful implementation of the non-pharmacologic therapies that we're talking about across the next couple of days, and to reduce the knowledge gap, we really need to start talking about implementation science now, not five years from now. And we, all, we also need to include all the stakeholders in the process. It's not working. Um, that's my last slide anyway, so thank you very much. <laughs>